Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas, thanks for joining us. Can you, can you hear us? Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes, it does sound like we can hear you. It's a little bit quiet. I can barely hear you. Yeah, we're going to load him. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to join the session earlier. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Still quite okay. quiet, but that's that's okay. Um, Nicholas, would you mind just quickly sharing your screen just to um, make sure that everything is all working? Yes. Um, is it possible to use the video? Absolutely, I can do that for you. So no, no need to test out sharing your screen. Then um, I will play that when it gets to your turn. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Is the uh, proper pronunciation of your name Nicholas Stein? Okay. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, or good night to all of you, depending on where you are. I am Evan Sumer Rosenberg. I am streaming at you live from the lovely outdoor balcony in Davidson, North Carolina. Um, I will be the chair of today's session, Locomotion Europe. Um, we have five speakers today. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, the format of this is that all the talks are going to go back to back. And then we will have a joint Q&A session with the authors uh, at the very end of the session. Um, please uh, type out any questions in the Locomotion Europe channel in Discord, and those will be selected, and then I can ask those questions on your behalf during the final Q&A. All right, with that, we can leap right into the first paper, which will be presented by Jihei Han from KU Leuven. All right, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, uh, hi everyone. My name is Jihei and today I'll be presenting foldable spaces and a virtual direction approach for natural walking in virtual reality. Uh, the challenge we are aiming to tackle is to enable natural walking for virtual environments that are larger than the physical environment available. So why do we want to enable natural walking in the first place? especially when there are supernatural methods such as teleportation available. Well, locomotion studies have shown that natural walking shows benefits in a higher sense of presence, spatial understanding, and cognitive engagement. And uh, the body research that actually tackles this challenge is redirected walking as a series of techniques that manipulates a user's trajectory to stay within the bounds of a tracking volume. So greater techniques can actually be categorized into subtle or overt, depending on whether the VR user can notice the presence of the redirection. They can also be categorized over the nature of the redirection, namely manipulations to the architecture of the virtual environment or manipulations to the mapping between the user's real to virtual movement. Now here I briefly list a few most closely situated to our own work, 
namely those that manipulate the architecture of a virtual environment. Uh, so one, for example, is impossible spaces, which compresses a large virtual environment into smaller physical tracking volume by overlapping discrete parts of the virtual environment. This technique is subtle, meaning that the users do not notice this change, and they would never at any point in time actually see the overlapping spaces. You would, it would only visualize one room at a time. In contrast, overt redirection techniques forego attempted to hide changes, uh, these redirection changes from the user whatsoever. And they do tend to be a bit more flexible in terms of the minimum walkable space that you need to implement the redirection itself, as was the visual uh, representation of the virtual environment because you don't need to hide anything from the user. So for instance, space bender is an overt technique that enables you to walk to an infinitely long corridor that and this corridor bends whenever you come in close proximity to a physical obstacle. And where is our own work situated within this body of research? Well, foldable spaces is an overt redirected technique that manipulates the architecture of a virtual environment to dynamically fold a virtual environment depending on the trajectory of uh, the VR user. So we thus developed three novel foldable techniques called horizontal, vertical, and accordion. And we compared this against the base technique called stop and reset. And we chose stop and reset from the body of locomotion techniques because it was one overt, two, it mapped virtual to real movement at one-to-one -one scale, and it did not cause any permanent distortions to the geometry of the virtual environment. And just to show how these techniques work, horizontal um, enables you to walk through layers of virtual space, kind of like the pages of a book. It subdivides a large virtual environment into discrete multiples of the tracking volume. Vertical enables you to walk to adjacent spaces uh, by rotating the virtual environment closer towards you on a vertical axis. And accordion corrugates and flattens virtual space to bring faraway places closer to the user. It does use a similar folding mechanic to horizontal. However, with the additional two axes of folding enables you to see the whole virtual environment as opposed to only discrete parts of it. And as a quick preview of how this looks like from first person uh, perspective. And lastly, stop and reset. Uh, we did implement a hands-free adaptation of stop and reset, where user proximity to a trigger, in this case, a virtual door, enables the overt transformation, which is namely rotating the user by 180 degrees. And for the experiment itself, we set up a within-subject study composed of 20 participants. We tasked the users to search for three instances, a specified virtual object, and gave them a maximum of three minutes to explore the virtual environment. The virtual environment we used was um, six times the size of our physical and, well, the physical tracking volume. And it, well, and although theoretically we could use a virtual environment in, in, of any size of any multiple of the physical tracking volume, we kind of set it to this size to enable the users to explore the virtual environment within the given time period. And after the task, we also asked participants to complete a cognitive engagement task composed of a 10 question memory recall test and a sketch map exercise, where we asked participants to mark down the locations of these search objects, and as well as draw any other details they can remember. <clears throat> However, we did not notice any significant differences regarding the cognitive task performance scores, but the sketch maps themselves provided interesting insights. For example, four participants specifically in horizontal through their maps as fragmented levels as opposed to a single continuous space, um, kind of insinuating that they saw this whole environment due to the folding as a spatially different experience. And we also logged the user's coordinates uh, throughout the uh, experiment itself. One of the most important findings we found was that participants walked significantly more smoothly in accordion than horizontal and stop and reset, despite users walking at comparable velocities for each technique. Actually, in the semi-structured interviews later, one of the participants said, in accordion, I kept on walking and walking and walking. I even had to look through the hole in the VR headset to make sure that it wasn't walking into a physical wall. And because safety is a very important aspect of redirection to make sure that the user doesn't bump into a physical wall uh, when they leave the tracking volume, uh, we calculated safety where safe is defined as a boolean of whether the user left the tracking volume or not. We did notice that VR users left tracking volume uh, somewhat frequently in stop and reset. And the results show that 
horizontal accordion were considered something that can be safer than solid reset. And at the very end, we asked participants to rank each technique. Accordion was significantly the most preferred of all the foldable techniques. The interviews asked later on provided further insights as to why. For horizontal, nine participants said that they disliked being unable to see the whole environment. Uh, for three people in vertical and six people in stop and reset, they mentioned disliking sudden shifts in orientation. And participants, 10 participants also said they disliked having doors against the ground plane, which is what was implemented by horizontal and accordion, as opposed to uh, vertical and stop and reset. However, four of these participants also mentioned that these two techniques felt kinetically more natural to walk through as a walking experience, despite, the, uh, despite that. Uh, flat doors. And other questionnaires that we did implement was the SUS presence score um, questionnaire and the simulations questionnaire. However, we did not notice any significant differences. And finally, to wrap up, uh, three notes on conclusion, we present foldable spaces at another viable approach for over a tree direction and to show a few design considerations for this direction for overt. Notes of the technique, um, we suggest that you provide overarching views of the virtual environment to avoid any sudden shifts in orientation to create a smooth experience and also provide eye level information as navigation cues, uh, as opposed to flat doors kind of having upright doors or any other eye level navigation cue. And as a final note, we see that our work provides interesting insights into enabling kinetically natural walking through visually supernatural environments. Uh, we do see VR um, to have the potential of creating these kind of fantastical uh, imagery and very fictional, but also very supernatural things that can't exist in real life, but to use over to redirection as a way to enable very real, very natural walking experiences through these very supernatural environments. And uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Jihei. Um, as a reminder, please everyone uh, put your questions into Discord and we will uh, ask those at the very end. Uh, now we will move directly on to the second speaker, who is Daniel Mendez from INESC TEC, Faculdade de in I I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that, and Universidad de do Porto. I am sorry, you have many affiliations. <laughs> Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, it's basically University of Porto. That's fine. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Daniel Mendes, and I will present uh, our paper entitled Design and Evaluation of Travel and Orientation Techniques for Desk VR. In virtual reality, while natural metaphors such as walking can be desirable, they are often limited by hardware or available physical space and they may also lead to fatigue, reducing users' performance. The issue of fatigue can be addressed in some cases by exploring VR experiences bound to a seated position. And indeed, seated and desk VR have been target of recent research, including in applications such as information visualization and radiology. To navigate in VR while seated, we can resort to existing techniques that are not developed for such settings. As such, this might not be the best approach. Other techniques designed for seated VR experiences exist, such as walking by cycling and leaning with an heavy chair, but they often have very specific requirements and can also be tiring. Touch input is an, is an alternative that has not been very explored in VR. We believe that touch techniques that were not conceived for immersive environments also have potential in such settings. For instance, drag and go allows the user to travel towards a specified target with a single drag action, and finger walking in place maps regular walking to a motor equivalent action. In this work, we explore ways to make users retain an immersive VR experience while seated without sacrificing physical comfort, focusing on navigation. We evaluate a set of techniques, both for travel and orientation, to assess which work best for desk VR. Some techniques are based on previous works that, uh, adapted to desk VR, while others are novel proposals making use of natural touch and gesture metaphors. For this, we explore both VR controllers and a large touch sensitive surface separately. With these interactive surfaces, we aim to increase users' comfort by allowing them to use their hands, similarly to what is done in typical desktop scenarios with mouse and keyboard, which have been successfully used for prolonged inter interactive sessions. Starting with travel techniques, 
The continuous directional movement consists of pointing the controller in the intended direction, like the hand steering approach. When pressing the trigger, the user will move in such direction, and the intensity of the trigger pull defines the movement's velocity. The dog pedal technique uses repeated gestures on the touch surface to move users in the direction of their gaze. It's based on the same concept of motor equivalence behind the finger walking in place, but with a higher focus on ergonomics. We adapted Drag and Go to VR. Similarly to, to Dog Pedal, this method uses, uses users' gestures to move in the user's gaze direction. However, the final position is determined in the, move, in the moment the gesture begins, being fi fixed until the gesture ends. The distance between this, uh, the starting touch position and the bottom of the surface is mapped to the distance between the original user position and the final position in the virtual environment. For orientation, the continuous directional rotation consists in indicating the direction of rotation and velocity using an analog streak. With tactile surface dragging, users drag one hand horizontally over the surface to proportionally rotate towards the opposite direction like the commonly used smartphone swipe, as if they were dragging the virtual environment. The choose and click technique consists of pointing towards the intended final direction of rotation using the analog stick. After defining the direction and without releasing the stick, the user can press a button to confirm the rotation. The gaze converses technique uses the final orientation of the head instead of the analog stick, allowing users to simply look in the intended direction then users can confirm the action with the press of a button. To compare these techniques, we conducted the user evaluation with 12 participants. Most were between 18 and 32 years old, and eight participants had no pre pre previous experience with VR whatsoever. We conceived a total of four travel tasks with ordered checkpoints. The first task was a mixed set of vertical and horizontally placed checkpoints. The second and third tasks were mostly a set of horizontally and virtually spread checkpoints, respectively. The fourth task had only a single checkpoint on the opposite side of the virtual environment. Regarding the results, continuous directional movement was faster than drag and go in the mixed, horizontal, and vertical tasks. In the vertical task, it was also faster than dog pedal, having a shorter distance covered. Drag and go was slower than dog pedal in the mixed task and had a larger distance covered than continuous directional movement in dog pedal in the first three tasks. However, it was faster than these two in the longer task. Questionnaire results regarding ease of use and effort are aligned with these performance results. There were three tasks used to test orientation methods. These had a set of, of checkpoints which participants must align their, body, their virtual body with. The first task was a mix of small and large rotations, the second was a set of small rotations, and the third had large rotations only. Regarding the results, choose and click was the slowest in all tasks. Gaze convergence had a smaller total rotation than continuous directional uh, rotation in the small rotations task, and user preferences went towards continuous directional rotation and tactile surface drag. We also made some observations. There was some reported neck pain with gaze-oriented techniques. Also, we noticed that participants used a very small portion of the interactive surface and tended to adopt a relaxed pose when using the continuous techniques. And lastly, participants reported very few cyber sickness symptoms. And to conclude our presentation, uh, we proposed and evaluated a set of travel and orientation techniques for desk VR. And continuous methods attained good results, and there was a tend towards tactile surface dragging for rotation. As future work, we intend to explore the combination of spatial and touch inputs uh, together. So this ends our presentation, and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, our next speaker is Christian Hurt from ETH Zurich. Am I? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, you, uh, I'm sorry. I skipped that. Uh, our next speaker is Niklas Stein from University of Münster. My apologies. Hi, my name is Niklas Stein, and today I'm presenting our paper Eye Tracking Based LSTM for Locomotion Prediction in Virtual Reality. Whenever we use natural walking to explore environments in virtual reality, 
we realize quickly that we are limited by our physical tracking space. One approach to tackle this problem is of course redirected walking. As most of you know, in redirected walking we use the track position of the user to constantly check if we are walking towards an obstacle, another user or the boundaries of our tracking space. If that is indeed the case, the user can be steered in a different direction using several methods. These methods benefit from an early prediction since earlier redirection allows the use of smaller gains. This makes the method less noticeable and more comfortable for the user. So how can we get this early locomotion prediction in virtual reality? In the literature we found two different approaches. First, information can be extracted from the virtual environment. Using skeleton maps, one can analyze all possible walking paths and make empirical assumptions based on previous data. However, this method must be adapted for each new virtual environment. And in some cases, such as dynamically generated virtual environments and tracking spaces with inside-out tracking, it is not readily applicable. Predictions can also be based on user data. Instead of relying on only our current position, we can use available data such as walking speed, walking direction and head orientation and use this information to estimate where we will go next. Additionally, eye tracking data have been shown to be useful in finding the next likely walking target into AFC tasks and this could be an interesting predictive tool. When we look at previous non-VR eye tracking research, it was shown that walkers often look at the ground in front of them, particularly in uneven environments. But they also look at targets on the horizon that they could approach or even avoid. Moreover, when walking in a curve and changing direction, gaze is usually directed inward toward the apex of the next curve. In addition, there is a systematic relationship between gait, eye and head movements. Overall, Gaze data provide a rich, though not straightforward, signal for the estimation of action intention. Based on these considerations, we wanted to determine whether gaze data could be useful for data-driven predictions. In this study, we used LSTM models to predict the future position of walkers in VR based on walking velocity, HMD orientation, eye tracking data and body rotation. All obtained from the HTC Vive Pro Eye. To generate the necessary training data for our model, we conducted a user study. Here you can see a video of the first person perspective of the user during the study. On the left you can see a bird's eye view. The blue rays illustrate the user's gaze direction, which was not visible during the trial. Task 1 was to search for a target object among six identical looking distractors. Here he just found it. In this task, the user is free to choose where to go next, making it a free exploration task. Task 2 requires the user to walk along a curved transition corridor to a door into the next room. The third task involved walking towards a given target while avoiding a possible obstacle. To do this, the user had to press a red button, after which the target and obstacle appeared. Then the user had to walk towards the target while possibly avoiding an obstacle. This task was repeated four times under different conditions. Obstacle in the middle, obstacle on the left, obstacle on the right and no obstacle. All in all, one session lasted about 15 minutes. The dataset of our 18 participants is now available online. Looking into the collected data, we first checked whether the eye tracking calibration was still valid after the 15 minute walking experiment. This was indeed the case. In the walking in a curve task, we found patterns that were comparable to results from previous non-VR studies, which made us confident about the validity of our data. In the search task, we see that users also create walking paths during free exploration, which is of course a necessary condition for any kind of prediction algorithm. Here users preferred short routes to random trial and error. We then used the recorded position, orientation and eye tracking features from 2.5 second segments of the data to train an LSTM model that predicts the user's position 2.5 seconds into the future. We found that future position can be predicted with an average error of 65 cm. Here are two successful examples of 15 seconds of consecutive path predictions. The grey line represents the real path that the participant walked the blue line shows the successive predictions by the model. 
Since we were especially interested in the benefit of gaze data, we also examined how different LSTMs performed on the three different tasks with and without eye data. We found no difference when walking in a curve through the corridor. During search and obstacle avoidance, we found a small benefit. We then asked ourselves why this was the case, and we think the answer can be found in task-specific behavior. When users slowed down towards the predicted position or accelerated during the input sequence, gaze data were of greater use in our prediction models. Thus, tasks with changes in walking speed benefited from the inclusion of gaze data. As you have already seen, this interaction behavior was part of the obstacle avoidance and of the search task, but there was no interaction while walking through the corridor. In addition, we have found that eye tracking is more beneficial when the gaze target is close to the user. This is of course the case when walking towards a target with which one wants to interact. To summarize, what did we learn? First, eye tracking data from current VR hardware can be a useful tool for deep learning path prediction in VR. Second, it is particularly useful in situations where the user interacts with the virtual environment during locomotion. And I want to add that I think that these are the most interesting situations because interaction with virtual worlds is what makes VR so beautiful and interesting. Our results provide new insights into how gaze, gait, path planning and walking behavior interact with each other during different tasks. And I'm very proud of this project and I think we have shown that eye trackers are a useful tool for deep learning path prediction. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Nick Klaas. Uh, now we will move on to the fourth paper in the session, which, and I double checked it this time, it is indeed Christian Hurt from ETH Zurich. All right, thank you so much. Let me just share the screen. All right, should be all good, right? Looks good. All right, then let's get going. Hi there, uh, my name is Christian. I'm from ETH Zurich, and today I'm going to speak about uh, chaotic behavior of redirection, revisiting simulations and redirected walking. And given this, this is the third session of locomotion already, and there has been a lot of redirected walking um, already, I'm just going to assume you're familiar with the concept by now and skip further explanations on how it works. Besides skipping how it works, I'd like to briefly highlight how validation and redirection works, however. Now, somebody has a great idea, generally, uh, they implement that. Then they move over to testing and simulation to achieve a consistent performance with fine-tuned parameters and ideally end up with a proof of concept. Then this proof of concept can be applied to users in a real user study where we observe them react to the system while being exposed to it. Then, if everything works out fine, we can deploy the system and can have a lot of fun with redirection. However, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, and also along COVID, of course, researchers started to omit step of user studies in favor of simulation-based validations alone, arguing that such results would transfer to real humans easily. And exactly this shortcut is one of the main topics I'd like to address tonight. So simulation in redirected walking nowadays usually relies on some kind of locomotion model. But these models often fail to fully capture the nuances of natural locomotion due to simplifications. Among these, we picked an example which we encounter, encounter particularly often, but it could have been any simplified model, to be honest here. In this example on the left, simulated humans are expected to always move sequentially, which means they walk straight, then they turn, they walk straight again, then they turn, and so on and so on. At the same time, their heading is always aligned uh, with their walking direction. In contrast to this, on the right hand side, these are recordings from real users in user studies and the difference in the shape of the trajectories becomes immediately apparent. But then why should we even care about that? Well, let me take a step back. When testing new algorithms in the lab, we observed some inconsistencies there. The same person would undergo the same procedure, but results varied considerably. So we started to ask uh, the related questions. Why is this happening? And then we have high, even hypothesized about a, a butterfly effect then. To explore this, uh, we took one path, uh, 180 meters long, and simulated this one 100 times with steered gradient and reset to gradient conditions. And we only slightly varied the initial conditions, the positions, and the heading. And this is what we actually ended up with. See those slide variations here in the center? Neglectable, right? But if we follow just 
a couple of meters and three meters here, it's already spread out noticeably. Then we have a reset here, we go that further down here, have a reset again, and then uh, we go further north, north until it fades out for brevity. All right, so we put a couple of markers here, those X's. Um, these crosses, they mark where the final position of those 100 simulations eventually ended up. With. And as we can see, those are quite remarkably spread out through the whole tracking space. But why could this be the, the, the case? So let's follow one particular trajectory that we highlighted here in black. Um, we go here, reset here, we have a reset over here. And then what we have here is, uh, is a notably early reset compared to all the others that, that continue upwards here. And this is these occasional temporal shifts and resets are potentially the main reason where such a large discrepancy comes from. But then again, same question, why should we even care? The end poses are in no way pertinent redirected block and key performance indicators, right? So we need to evaluate the whole path. And again, we go for KPIs that are being commonly found in literature, like distance between resets and distance to closest walls. And then we went all in the simulation. Uh, we simulated four steering algorithms, three reset techniques, nine tracking spaces, and an overall five different path types. We used 32 kilometers of real paths, collected over multiple studies in the last couple of years. But just as, an, as a side now, we, we set up a parser removing any resets, and we ensured each segment to be at least 40 meters and 60 seconds long. Accordingly, there's a, there's a lot more in the full data set. We further synthetically generated an equivalent amount for each of the individual path types here. Thus, eventually we simulated each condition along all other conditions and ended up with roughly 200,000 individual simulations here. Or otherwise, it's 35,000 kilometers of redirected walking simulation. So let's show some results of these simulations. These are by no means all of them. It's just a tip of the iceberg. So please feel free to check out the paper um, where the other results are broken down further. In this case, we have a direct comparison of real and synthetic path types in a steer to gradient and reset to gradient condition in a six by six tracking space. Every single simulation is represented as a single point in the 2D plane, and they're using ice lines for better visualization. What we see here is a clear distinction between the redirection performance of the real path types here in red and in orange, the synthetically generated path types. The same also goes for the marginal distributions, as you can see here and here on the side. Uh, naturally, we also looked into the statistical significance uh, with the multivariate Wald Waldowitz test, which confirmed that these two distributions are indeed different. If we prefer non-medical results, uh, we got you covered as well. Here we focus on the distance between resets, and we also looked into all steering algorithms and all path types. It's simulated in a reset to gradient reset condition in an eight by eight tracking space in this specific use case. Here, I'd also like to distinctively highlight this discrepancy between the real and also the synthetically generated um, paths, considering the performance of redirected walking. So let's conclude with a couple of key messages here. Given the qualitatively shown chaotic characteristics and thus the sensitivity of redirection on its underlying data, together with the distinction between synthetically generated and recorded user data, it's dangerous to assume a straightforward transfer between the two. Therefore, simulation-based validation alone on synthetically generated paths is a very risky evaluation methodology since projection on real humans results in a certain loss of reality. However, we of course strongly encourage the user simulation as a part of the redirected walking development pipeline. But based on our results, it's crucial to at least use path data recorded from real users. I saw some respective notes in the Discord channel already, uh, so I'm really happy about this development in the future. And finally, on a personal note, um, omitting real users from validation removes the human component of acceptance and well-being. Um, and the best redirection system can still be rejected by humans due to some underlying issues not manifested in a simulated validation. And in the end, redirected walking is made for humans, and that's why they, they matter exactly. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, now we have, are going to move to the 
uh, fifth and final presenter of the session. As a reminder, uh, we are going to immediately move into a joint Q&A with the authors of all papers after this presentation. So please do type out all of your questions for any of the authors in, just in the Discord channel. Just please label which paper you are. Uh, your question is meant to go to. Okay, and with that, we can uh, then proceed to the final presentation, which will be from Carlo Fleming from the University of Trier. And I would like to present our work about our paper where we concentrated ourselves on further developing the seated embodied locomotion travel method. First of all, why embodied locomotion and here especially leaning? Well, leaning already has been proven to be a suitable alternative interface for traveling compared to the standard controller interfaces. There are already many implementations and interpretations of the interface. The basic idea that they all have in common is that virtual movement is influenced by an inclination of the user's body or parts of it. This includes speed and or direction. Advantages of this method are for example the positive effect on self-motion, improvement on task performance compared to controller-based interfaces, at least users hands-free for other kinds of interactions, and the seated method comes with a higher cyber sickness mitigation. When using leaning, your upper body is basically representing a joystick which lets you steer through the virtual world. Unfortunately, seated leaning comes with disadvantages as well. A crucial one being is that leaning can trigger the locomotion interface unintentionally. Similar to how a controller makes use of a person's hands and prevents them from performing additional action, as that interface is already in use, embodied locomotion can result in the same issues with the user's body by binding it to accelerational movement only. This makes it difficult to pick something up from the ground or look underneath a piece of furniture. In the case of joystick interfaces, this is not an issue because it can be released and this leaning, this causes a problem due to the fact that we need to move and lean in order to perform other tasks in VR and can't release in a joystick. You will unintentionally activate the leaning interface because as you will need to leave the dedicated mouth position. Our main goal was to create a solution to avoid these unintentional activations. We give users more control over their virtual and physical movements and avoid unintentional movements. We developed and tested different status control approaches that can switch on and off embodied locomotion interfaces. For this, we use well-established input modalities for VR interaction, physical buttons, voice, gestures, and a metaphor. The status control methods developed around these input modalities has led us to developing the following six methods. First of all, we tried to use approaches to avoid any disruption of the embodied locomotion interface. Two of our methods don't use a break. The first is our baseline method, where we implemented a classical physical based collision avoidance system, which pauses the leaning locomotion interface when the user is about to steer into a physical object placed in the virtual environment. With this method, we try to explore whether it is possible to avoid the use of a passive or active braking mechanism by changing the classic behavior of the leaning interface. We try to apply a Gaussian function to the interface so as you go further away from a certain point, your speed will start decreasing again. This way, it is possible to be at a zero speed when you are further away from the zero position. We came up with a standard controller button press and hold as one of the first methods to actively pause the interface. We used an easy to reach script button for that. Our speech method allowing the user to pause the interface by voice input. In our implementation we selected the word pause to pause the interface and started to resume it. The back escape method uses a user's physical movement as a trigger to deactivate and reactivate the embodied locomotion interface. Leaning back into the pause zone deactivates the interface allowing the user to move freely without unintentional activation. The user must lean forward into the intersect dummy object, in this case a sphere, to reactivate the interface. 
Our dual state method is a hoverboard, which also requires the use of a controller, but also offers the visual and sound feedback to the user. The board is purely virtual and doesn't need any additional devices. It can be activated by putting it in front of your body and deactivated by returning it to your back. We created a simple task-oriented virtual environment, evaluated each method using a vision subject's design with a total number of 18 participants, of which we have 14 males and 4 females, with a median age of 31.5 years. Each participant had 15 tasks to complete for each status control method. First, they had to move between five cubes at different heights and look underneath them to complete each task. Following that, they collected an object and moved between another five cubes and looked underneath them to complete the next five tasks. Finally, they collected a second sphere in their other hand and moved between the last five cubes and looked beneath them to complete the final five tasks and therefore the overall objective. Looking at the results here, the sus scores of the methods rated by each participant to the right. On the left, the completion times of all participants, also for every method. The main findings were Gauss, which seemed to require a steeper learning curve than the other methods. When only one hand or neither were being used to hold a sphere, the hoverboard and button performed best. Unsurprisingly, the opposite became true when the second interaction task blocked the controllers completely. What was really unexpected was that despite the time to complete the movement to activate and deactivate the hoverboard, the overall completion time using this method did not vary too much from button. The sus scores on the feedback received afterwards from participants showed in favor of the hoverboard method. Overall, we can say the best choice for a status control method for seated leaning based locomotion interfaces always depends on your application. In our work, we were able to show that status control methods should be used together with embodied locomotion interfaces when the application focus is not purely traveling. Controller-based methods perform best overall, with a pure virtual hoverboard method being the one that stands out. This method did not only seamlessly integrate status control in an immersive manner, but also potentially completes the leaning metaphor. Further recommendations strongly depend on the amount of times your application needs to use brakes, needs to travel backward, or has colliders. We can only recommend not to use girls. Okay, um, let's give a round of applause to all of our authors. Um, now we are going to move into the uh, joint Q&A. And in order to make sure that we get to ask questions of every author, I'm not going to just ask a whole bunch of questions for the first one. I'm going to ask uh, one question, then move on and, and uh, alternate uh, between authors until we're out of time. Um, so I'll start with uh, the foldable spaces paper. We, we have um, a number of questions on this. Um, the first question I see is from Leon Chun and said, thanks for a great presentation. I have a question for foldable spaces. From the example video of the prototype, I could see the transition of the changing room. Is there any reason why that part is not eliminated? Like, is there any specific reason why you left it there on purpose? And I think this is um, probably somewhat related to this. Uh, second question is, you mentioned that there is no significant differences in simulator sickness. Does that mean that there are cyber sickness, but the degree of sickness was same overall, or that there was no cyber sickness? Uh, all right, well, thank you for the great questions. Regarding the first question, I'm not exactly sure what the transition you're talking about. Is it the folding that you're talking about, or is it related to a specific technique? Uh, I'm not, uh, sure what, 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 I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what, the, yes, so it was the folding. So that was my assumption. It was the accordion, the transition during the accordion. All right, so transition is there to, well, enable you to see, uh, it's very technique specific. Okay, so in terms of accordion, um, I might as well just share my screen actually, because it does make things a bit easier. But essentially, uh, why this transition is there is to enable you to see the whole environment, to pull, I guess, the whole environment as opposed to just horizontal. In terms of why 
create the folding in the first place without just teleporting the user from point A to point B. Well, that's just to create a continuous uh, walking experience where the user does not have a sudden shift in perspective. This was actually noted as one of the more disorienting factors of uh, stop and reset and, um, and vertical. And which I guess leads straight into the second question you asked regarding signal to sickness. So I can only claim that in this experiment where there will be used a floor space of four by four meters where users only really spent three minutes in that there were no significant differences found. There was similar to sickness uh, differences, just not anything um, significant. Here's a view, my aha slide of expecting someone to ask this question, but as you can see here, vertical was much higher than other techniques um, accordion, horizontal, and stop and reset were more or less around the same for the similar sickness scores, but vertical actually specifically this orientation category of the similar sickness questionnaire uh, scored very high. And this was also further looked into for um, the semi-structured interviews where a lot of participants disliked the fact that uh, the, the, with the vertical rotation, they could see that the room was kind of coming towards their face, which for some users was a slightly scary experience and a lot of them didn't like the fact that the floor below them was moving. Um, and those are very brief answers to your questions, but I do hope that does address uh, <laughs> your question. Okay, great, thank you. And you get uh, definite bonus points for having extra slides prepared for anticipated questions, well done. Um, all right, uh, I'll ask a question then for the second paper, Design and Travel of or uh, Travel and Orientation Techniques for Desk VR. Uh, this is from Ishan Gumilar. Thanks for sharing your result. I have a few questions. Since we are doing research on eye tracker data in VR, HTC Provide Pro I, I'm wondering what kind of features you took into account in creating a model. Do you think that there is any other features other than the UVU so far that can enhance the actual, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, this seems the, that the, the volunteer copied this in the wrong, perhaps in the wrong place. I believe this sounds like it's for the eye tracking paper. So I'll just continue. Um, do you think that there is any other features other than what you have used so far that can enhance the accuracy of the model in prediction based on eye data? So hopefully yeah, the, I think the uh, author of that This question is that. for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, we basically started by uh, trying to just throw everything we had at it to get kind of the best prediction result. Um, and then we slightly reduced, I think, uh, in the Discord, I added a table so you can get an idea of like which features made the prediction better and uh, which did not. Um, what we also tried to do, and this is maybe the most interesting thing, um, is to kind of uh, extract something, some more information from the eye tracking signal. And uh, we tried to extract the cards, but this did not really work with the eye tracker that is in the HTC uh, Vive Pro Eye. Um, but I think one can gain more information and maybe better prediction um, with better eye tracking. And when you kind of yeah, put more effort into really identify, identifying where subjects are looking at and to kind of interpret this kind of signal, but yeah. Thank you. Um, now uh, I'll go back to uh, the second paper and ask a question. Uh, this is actually a question for me. Um, I was wondering about how much uh, variability that you saw in your sample size in terms of your results. And the, the reason is because of, you have a, a relatively small sample size of n equals 12. So I'm wondering um, whether there's a lot of variability or whether the results were you, that you observed looked consistent enough that you think the, the sample size was generalizable? Thank you for the question. Um, there was some variability between, between users. Um, we trusted the, the, the statistical analysis and only reported those, those the statistically significant ones. Uh, but yes, the, 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 we agreed that the sample is, is quite small. That, that was a the consequence of, of the, the, the pandemic times, uh, it was kind of difficult to, to, to conduct the test. Uh, but I think that the, the statistically significant results might be um, general, uh, can be uh, applied in, in, a, in, a, in a larger sample, yeah. 
Uh, thank you. And yes, I, 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 we are all in the same boat as far as the difficulties of human subjects during the pandemic. So I yes. totally understand uh, the limitations there. Um, all right, let's ask a question for uh, paper four, the chaotic behavior of redirection. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying I have probably have like 20 questions, but I'm going to hold those. And then Christian, hopefully we can just chat offline. Um, the first question I'll ask, it comes from Eric Hodgson. And he says, wonderful work. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the other day, we saw a talk arguing that even though a simulation of a given algorithm is admittedly different than real user walking results, the qualitative comparison of one simulated algorithm to another simulated al algorithm seems to accurately reflect their performance relative to each other. Do you see these talks as being in tension or addressing different questions? Wow, what a question. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I don't think that those two talks are intention at all. The point is, uh, what I saw in Maddie's talk uh, is um, that this, the, the, this, uh, the kind of environment that he created basically consists of, of single straight lines. Um, yeah, it consists of single straight lines that are connected together. And on this, uh, he predicted, or like he put his trajectory and then let humans walk this trajectory specifically. Now, concerning what we explored is that the straight condition of, of aligning literally straight lines there is actually the one that comes closest to the real paths eventually. So we're basically saying the same thing in this particular example. Yeah, and, and as you know, that uh, talk is, is the work from my lab. So, um, I, and I, I would tend to agree with you that we are both kind of looking at this problem differently um, and that these, these results are complementary. And it would be very, very interesting to kind of talk about our results um, kind of collaboratively together. So I look forward to hopefully doing that. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so, so let's uh, ask a question. We have a question uh, for um, how to take a break. Um, from uh, Steve Feiner, he, he asked, with respect to take a break, did you look at any measures of VR sickness and how they might be affected by the method used and how the user's body moved when using it? Um, we did not um, check for uh, sicknesses, but um, generally um, people um, who didn't understand uh, the Gauss method um, became or felt a bit more uh, cyber sick than with other methods. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go loop back to paper number one and we'll start this cycle again. Um, let's see, uh, we have a question here from Hedges Copper. Hi, nice work on fo foldable spaces. As the foldable spaces transition, there is a perceived distortion in the user view. Did you see issues of balance or visually induced motion sickness during the transition? Um, he, he's asking uh, more about, again, about did you explore different transition speeds which could affect balance and sickness? And I know you've already answered, Jihei, the, the uh, questions related to sickness. So I'll just add as an addendum to Hedges' question um, that uh, I had a similar uh, question about, uh, less about the sickness, but about balance. Um, I, Cause I thought your illusion looked, the, the, the accordion illusion looked super cool. Um, but I was wondering about sort of how that would affect because the, you know, the, the, the ground plane and, and, you know, kind of the, the visual cues that you're seeing um, are that you use for the stability of, uh, of your body are moving. And I was wondering if that, even if it doesn't make people sick could affect sort of their postural stability. Um, so in terms of balance, uh, this is actually interesting enough. Um, actually, before I tested accordion, I was a bit worried because it's actually the most complex folding mechanism of those three techniques, that people would be a bit visually overwhelmed. Uh, from their user studies, it seemed that because the space that the user was standing on was not moving, it was just anything where the door was that it started to fold upwards and drag like the rest of the environment towards them because it was just a part in front of them and they had that kind of, perhaps it's a security of knowing. Um, it wasn't, it didn't really cause this uh, issue of balance in terms of this nausea. What did actually call, um, people did bring up more as causes of nausea was one, as explained before, the vertical, where the balance was because, because the floor moved below you, kind of felt like you should 
be off center and then um, actually a bit for horizontal. And I believe this is because just spatially speaking, uh, it was an interesting experience for quite a lot of them. Actually, uh, one of the comments we got was that they were climbing up and down as opposed to walking through um, laterally adjacent spaces, which I thought was quite interesting. And perhaps um, horizontal is just more suited for a different type of virtual typology um, as opposed to one that was represented. Great. Yeah, my first reaction upon seeing your video of that was, I want to try that. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so the next question I have, uh, I actually have a question um, for uh, Niklas that comes from me, um, and that's related to, um, to gender effects. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, had analyzed, because because you did have, if I remember correctly, you did have a balanced uh, gender sample or reasonably balanced gender sample in your eye tracking data. And I'm wondering if you uh, tried to tease that apart and see if there were uh, differences, given that you know there are there is research in uh, kind of spatial cognition that's shown that uh, men and women have different strategies for navigating three D spaces. Mm, we actually have not uh, looked into that yet, but I think it's an interesting idea to do it. Um, but I have to say that one thing we did, um, like after piloting the experiment, we really stripped down the whole room. I mean, you have seen the video; there was like no really uh, visual stuff in there because we really wanted to restrict everything to the navigating part and not have stuff being there and i think that you may find a lot of gender differences in or maybe more differences individual differences um like uh, when you have a lot of stuff there and uh, when you really strip down the whole room then like most subjects really had very similar patterns um but it's anyway i think it's a cool idea and uh, yeah maybe we have to look into that Hey, great, thank you. Um, next, another uh, question for Christian from Gerald Thomas. Uh, great presentation. How did you select the path generation algorithm that creates the synthetic paths you compared against the recorded path? Oh, well, that one's simple. Uh, we were very used to using the redirected walking toolkit to do simulations. Um, that's why exactly we used it. We could have used other more complex uh, locomotion models there, but we chose to, to stick with one model that is already established uh, around the, the research community there. I love that answer. Um, okay, uh, next question for um, how to take a break. Uh, nice work, Carlo and the team. This comes from Kyle Johnson. How much of the relative performance of the hoverboard technique do you think can be attributed to simply having some reasonable metaphor for the user, as opposed to that specific metaphor? Um, I think um, it's always better that if you, the um, if you, if there is any metaphor uh, for for the people, um, I think that's what the study shows to board, because um, only the controller itself um, that. Um, did perform less good, even so it was more work to uh, lift the board up uh, than uh, just press the button of a controller. So yeah, I think other metaphors do work well as well. Okay, thank you. Um, next question I have is for foldable spaces. Uh, this comes from Christian Halverson. Do the rooms in a foldable space need to be carefully designed to be compatible with each other, or is there a simple method to build comparable rooms? How difficult and time consuming is designing foldable spaces compared to regular virtual spaces? Awesome question. Um, so the way that's currently implemented is that it's kind of like cell based. So you have these pages and you just kind of stick them next to each other and then um, the way that I've implemented it, in which we actually created it in Unreal, is that I just kind of fill in some simple content generation to create like whatever you want in it to make them have walls and et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, you just move these pages next to each other and then it, the folding works as in terms of, yep, just building a virtual environment. So as long as you have your assets with you and just replace some things with the content uh, generation inside these kind of blueprints, um, then you're in good shape. Uh, in terms of, I guess, what you can do um, in the future, well, one of the things we wanted to implement was not just to create corridor-like spaces, but also just continuously being able to add these kind of pages onto each other in any direction. And that is something we've yet to do, but 
It's just a matter of folding in the other direction. Okay, um, I think I've uh, actually exhausted almost all my questions except for a couple more for Jihei. Um, uh, from Vincent Harvard, what about spa user spatial representation after the experiment? Are they able to draw the map of the visited place? Uh, so, um, yep, they are. In terms of the folding itself, you always work with the same virtual environment. If you go from point A to point D, then you can always find your way back from point D to point A because it's just folding the same environment. Nothing's changing except when you want to move from one place to the other. Uh, and yeah, people were able to draw these sketchups quite accurately, despite the fact that they're only really there for three, um, three minutes. I think I've shown very, very briefly a few sketch maps, but they include details like windows, location where the plants were, location of where the random fox I put in the environment was. So in terms of um, spatial recollection, yes, I would say. Okay, great. Um, and I think this is the last question I have also from Christian Halverson. How do you tr trigger a fold? Is it just when the user gets close enough to the door? If so, would this force the user to avoid the door trigger to reach certain points of the virtual room? Um, so the door only triggers, yes. Well, for the vertical doors, I guess that's quite obvious. You walk towards a vertical door and it, the door kind of opens for you like an automatic door. Um, but for the doors flat against the ground, you kind of have to imagine it if it's like flat against there. There's only really one direction that you walk towards it and then the door will trigger with the full wheel transformation. If you try to enter from the other way, it doesn't work because theoretically you're walking like on the roof, roof top of the door. It's just like at that one point when you enter in that one direction that the door does trigger. So yes, you would need to avoid this point um, in terms of being unable to trigger. However, you can stand in the middle of the door and the place and the fold will just kind of stay the way it is. So the environment will fold, but you'll be within the doorway. So you do have the choice of walking back out if you don't actually wish to go to the next room. Okay, thank you all for your answers. Um, let's, uh, I know we're all remote, but, and probably most of us by ourselves, but let's give a round of applause again for all of our speakers of this session. Um, and with that, I will uh, conclude the session. Thank you, everyone.